From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. Facing a midnight deadline, supporters and detractors of abortion rights await the Supreme Court's ruling on the drug Mifepristone. Speaker McCarthy planning to bring his debt ceiling bill to the House floor for a vote next week, but the big question remains, does he have the votes? And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis makes his second trip within a week to Washington, D.C. But as former President Trump continues to hammer him on social media, is the governor making any progress with support among his party? Joe, it's Friday. Yeah. We don't have a decision yet, and they have until midnight. This is the Supreme Court to decide whether or not they maintain either status quo uh, or they kick the can down the road, and we could be doing this again on Monday. That is entirely possible. It's good to let our viewers know that we are still waiting for the ruling, and this could go any number of ways, including just another hurry up and wait. This could happen any time between now and midnight, Emory. Right. And as we await that decision, joining us around the table, Bloomberg Sarah Forden and Jack Fitzpatrick. Sarah, let's start with you. The Supreme Court decided not to make this decision and kick it down the road Friday till midnight. But they could do that once again, as Joe and I just talking about. But what's going on? Take us behind the wall here. What's going on at the Supreme Court? What are the motions of this? So the first thing to understand is what is in front of them right now is whether to uphold or not the stay that the Biden administration requested on the ban. So we've got a couple layers here. So just to walk everybody through this. So if they grant the stay on the restrictions, that means that the status quo prevails and the, the drug mefepristerone is available also in, you know, by mail, um, also as generics, you know, the full sort of um, current situation. If they deny the stay, that means then the restrictions go into effect. So you could not get this drug by mail. You could not get the generics. You would have to have a doctor prescribe it. And so that would change the way, you know, women have been getting access to this drug. Are there any shades uh, of this? Could there be limited restrictions? You, is there something, is there an in-between ruling that might go, not go as far as Texas, but, but apply some restrictions to this drug nonetheless? Well, so a very interesting scenario that we're watching for, um, but it's not by all means sure, is they could decide to actually take up the case and hear it themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we have two lower courts that are in conflict. That's a classic situation where the Supreme Court weighs in. So you have Texas, you know, which has imposed the ban. You have a Washington judge, which has uh, allowed the FDA to continue to distribute this medication and authorize this medication. So that is another scenario that we're watching for. Mm -hmm. The fact that they have not yet come out and they asked for this extension, there's obviously been del deliberations. What does that tell us? Well, of course, they're not revealing what's going on behind the curtain, but we think that they have possibly come to a decision, but the extension may have been to allow some justices to write their dissents. Um, and to, to really put down, you know, their, their positions on this. Um, there is a very slim chance they could not act by the midnight deadline. We think that's extremely unlikely. Um, but if that were to happen, then the ban would go into effect um, by default. So lots of scenarios on the table. Wow. We're hearing from a lot of different voices, of course, on Capitol Hill, and some Democrats are not waiting to find out about this. We asked Democratic Senator Tina Smith about the Supreme Court's abortion bill decision. Here's what she said. I rarely agree with pharma, but this is a place where I do agree with them. So let's wait and see what the Supreme Court does. There's really only one right thing for them to do. Um, and people should not be thinking that there is a legislative fix if the court fails to uphold um, these fundamental uh, precedents. Jack, there may not be a legislative fix, as she puts it, but some House Democrats are actually moving on legislation in advance of this ruling to try to get their arms around what might happen, whether it involves FDA approval rules or their, their ability to simply approve abortion drugs. Do lawmakers have any say in what happens next year? Well, I think it's a fair point by the senator to say that the spotlight is on the courts now. Depending on the details of this ruling, I would very much imagine that that would dictate a legislative push that directs the FDA to potentially take some different path forward yep. that could comply with uh, whatever the outcome of this. There are tons of legislative uh, initiatives by Democrats that, depending on how this, I guess, gets injected into our politics, could be re-upped. Uh, for example, 
I, I think a lot of Democrats kind of lost interest in uh, getting rid of the Hyde Amendment that bars federal funding in almost all cases for abortion. Um, th does that come back? Uh, there were previous unsuccessful attempts to ensure that there are no legal negative ramifications for people who cross state lines to get an abortion or people yeah. who help them to do so. Uh, there, there's no shortage of Democratic legislation on abortion access that gets far into the weeds beyond, you know, codifying Roe or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think, one, this may provide a political impetus, uh, depending on the outcome of this, but also they, they probably will be reading the details of this to see if there's something they can direct the FDA to do yeah. or, or otherwise um, increase access to the greatest possibility. Mm -hmm. Jack, let's quickly get to what you spent most of your day, I'm sure, on, and that's the debt ceiling. Right now, what <laughs> we're reporting is that Kevin McCarthy does not have the votes. Does he get them in time to bring this bill to the floor on Wednesday? He wants, and all the Republicans I've talked to have said they want a vote by the end of next week. Um, they need 218 votes out of 222 members. They need to be almost unanimous. So they probably are not going to have 218 members saying, yes, I plan to vote for this until they're just about ready to go to the floor. Uh, it's going to be a messy process right up until maybe the end of next week. A and that's the goal they have. Do they succeed in getting it together and holding the vote by the end of next week? Uh, that's a tough prediction to make. I will point out that there's not a big caucus of people saying they have fundamental disagreements. There are debates over, is it 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week of work requirements? Um, it, they're, they're talking about the details of it, and it's individual members. Centrist Republicans in Biden districts, they're going to be able to vote for this? Uh, that is the question. Um, Brian Fitzpatrick from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, the Philly suburbs, uh, is undecided. Mm. I, I've heard a few more members on the conservative end saying they're pushing for more. Um, at one point, some leadership-aligned people have made, like Steve Womack from Arkansas, a little closer to the moderate side, is that if you get a hard time back in your district, you can tell people, honestly, this bill is not going to become law. If it's too conservative, if it's not, <laughs> this is to get the president to negotiate with them. Right. It's not going to become law. And to that end, actually, the White House is, of course, waiting to see what happens yeah. here. Anne-Marie, uh, Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre, uh, talking about the debt ceiling in the briefing room earlier today. Listen. We do not want to negotiate on this. We want to make sure that they do what they did the last three times uh, and avoid default. They need to put that bill, uh, put a clean bill on the floor uh, so that we do not, they do not continue to hold the American economy hostage. And that's what they're doing, which has, will have dangerous consequences uh, for not just our economy, for the American people. The White House has been nothing but consistent, if, if we want to give them credit for that, Jack. But is it possible that Kevin McCarthy brings this bill to the floor without knowing the outcome, or do we get no vote next week if he doesn't have 218? It would be really bad for him to have a failed vote. That's really what the White House and a lot of congressional Democrats are waiting for if uh, Kevin McCarthy makes a fool of himself and demonstrates that he does not have 218 votes, you have to wonder, does Mitch McConnell step in? Does the political calculus change and this stops being a Biden-McCarthy negotiation? Mm -hmm. So it, it, McCarthy's hand is strengthened greatly if he can get 218. Mm -hmm. If he can't and he proves it in a public way and fails in front of everybody, that's the worst case scenario. So we could hear about delays rather than just holding a vote where the leadership doesn't know what the result's yeah. going to be. You mentioned Mitch McConnell. He has said, this is not my job. I'm leaving this to Speaker McCarthy. What are the chances he is just able to strike a deal with the Democrats and do what he did with the last debt raise? He, he could, um, but their strength is in their House majority. And it's been very consistent from Senate Republicans, regardless of the you know moderates, uh, more conservative members. They know that the the tip of the spear for Republicans is the House majority. They are going to get the most out of this if Biden has to negotiate with McCarthy. Uh, you could see a, a Biden uh, McConnell deal. We've heard positive things about the Republican plan from Joe Manchin. So there's <laughs> there's a, a push sort of from the middle to get something fairly fiscally conservative. But the most conservative outcome that Republicans would like the most is going to come from forcing the president to get in a room with Kevin McCarthy. That's right. And the one thing we still do not have is an X date 
when that arrives, Jack, is that what finally lights the fire and say, you know, to inspire people to get in the same room here? They really need to be motivated before that. Um, it, you know, we just got past tax day. There are going to be groups uh, doing the math on exactly when yeah. what the receipts are doing. Um, I, I, I'm not sure we're going to get that until, it, you know, we, we could see more information coming out in mid-May. But if that information indicates that the X date is actually in early or mid-June, they are in problem. deep trouble. So they need to make progress before we get really, really confident about what the X date is, because when we get more information, it might be bad information. We might be very close to the point of no return. Lord. We can see the cliff coming. We just don't know when we're going over it here, right? <laughs> many thanks, Jack. Bloomberg's Jack Fitzpatrick and Sarah Ford, and many thanks for the insights and a great conversation to get us started today. Coming up, the deadline looming. Clearly, will the Supreme Court ban this abortion pill? What does it mean for the future? of these controversial medications. We'll talk about the implications of the ruling due out today with UC Davis law professor Mary Ziegler next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. that we've been really heartened by in the Biden administration is how many companies have really stepped up in these in these divisive times, particularly around the issue of abortion. There are companies throughout the country who have really tried to ensure that they're still providing access. That's an important element. That was Neera Tandon, an advisor to President Biden, speaking with Bloomberg last week as the fight over abortion access plays out in the co top court. As corporate America contends with how do they respond to these restrictions? Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons here with more. Kaylee, it's becoming much more difficult for corporate America to navigate all of these social issues based on whether you're in a red state or a blue, blue state. Yeah, it's definitely very tough. And we saw immediately in the wake of Dobbs, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, that some companies rushed to tell their employees they would pay for travel if you had to seek an abortion out of state as a result of that ruling. But companies are still under pressure now to really clarify their stances on abortion. And we are seeing this play out in this proxy season where shareholders mm. put forward different proposals. We have seen a relatively large uptick in reproductive health specific proposals, according to po Proxy Preview that put out a report. Back in 2019, we weren't even seeing reproductive health in the health category. Now we've seen dozens of these proposals uh, this year relative to others like pharmaceuticals, for example. And of course, abortion is a social issue that falls into this broader ESG umbrella, mm. and companies are facing a lot of other ESG proposals outside of just reproductive health or health issues. Climate change, political influence, human rights, these are some of the big ones. But you'll notice here, uh, in terms of share, anti-ESG proposals actually make up about 8% of this. We have also seen a massive uptick in that, according to a proxy preview, about 60% higher in terms of the number of anti-ESG proposals uh, put out their year to date compared to last year. And this is kind of part of this whole narrative around woke capitalism and the woke agenda and the pushback against that. If you just look at news trends, this is my favorite function to use on the Bloomberg terminal. NT Go will show you just the story count related to woke. We have seen a real pickup. Of course, we saw it uh, back in March as well around the failure of Silicon Valley Bank because we know there were certain members uh, of Congress, for example, blaming that bank's failure on being too woke. You know, it's interesting because nobody can define what woke is. Right. But you can <laughs> define ESG. It's just most people don't try to understand what these letters actually stand for. And we hear a lot about ESG uh, becoming a, a climate issue. But you're, to your point, there's much more to uh, those three letters than most people make out to be. Yeah, there's the environmental part, which is the climate that everyone yeah. usually points to first. But then there's social, under which abortion would fall into that umbrella. Governance as well, when we're talking about the diversity and makeup of corporate boards. So all of these are issues that uh, are part of these ESG proposals, of which we have seen literally hundreds, more than 500 in this season alone. But you do have that anti-ESG pushback, which really just speaks to the yeah. political difficulty and investor difficulty when companies are trying to navigate some of these issues. I mean, look at a company like Disney, which already actually had its shareholder meeting. It had investors pushing back against its stances on abortion and LBGTQ rights mm. uh, pretty heavily. And this is also playing out just in the state of Florida with Governor yeah, DeSantis. shareholders well. oh, and the governor of the state it. pushing yeah. back out against it. Also, what I think clearly comes to mind most recently is Walgreens. 
and mm -hmm. how they de-risked immediately to deal with some issues in red states, but then they got hit over the head by it in blue states. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, around the abortion pill, right? So it comes back to the issue of the day. You had, I believe it was a dozen attorneys general in states across the country who said that they could not do that. Walgreens said we aren't going to sell uh, in those states. And then you had Gavin Newsom oh, out in California, the governor there, saying, OK, well, then we're not going to use Walgreens for state business. And this is the state of California. It is a massive uh, public influence. So it, it goes to show you how the political uh, kind of pendulum can swing both ways. And corporate America, in many ways, is stuck in the middle. So if the court uh, sides with the Texas ruling on Mifepristone, things just got even more complicated for corporations. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just from a kind of PR standpoint, yeah. uh, you have to be very careful with the messaging around this for sure. But then in terms of literally what do you do? What do you need to provide for your employees? What do you need to be telling uh, your investors? Definitely something uh, that's that's very difficult to navigate. And then there's, of course, the pharmaceuticals aspect of it, which I know we were just uh, listening to what Tina Smith was saying earlier yes. this week to Bloomberg, the idea that pharmaceutical companies are suddenly front and center because this isn't just about abortion. This is about the FDA. And so that sector of corporate America in particular potentially could be drastically more influenced by this ruling, too. So we're getting to the point here now, Anne-Marie, where Republicans are at odds with corporations and Democrats yes. are all in on big pharma. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What's up is down. Yeah. Uh, Kaylee, great, great reporting. Thank you. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines with us on Balance of Power. Coming up, we'll talk with the, the we'll talk the complexities of the expected abortion pill ruling at the Supreme Court with law professor Mary Ziegler. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Thanks for joining us. Those on both sides of the abortion debate anxiously awaiting a Supreme Court ruling today on whether a widely used abortion pill can be banned. We've talked about it, Mifepristone, not by the FBA, but by, by a, a federal judge. The ruling today could have broad implications for how all pharmaceuticals are regulated, not just this one pill. And for more, we welcome back Mary Ziegler, law professor at UC Davis. Mary, thanks for joining us. Are you surprised we haven't received a ruling yet? Is this going to be a late Friday news break for us? Yeah, I mean, it might be. I, I think at this point, um, we may even, we, we've seen the court before let orders um, stays expire. Um, and hmm. that might happen too. I, I think we're in kind of uncharted territory with this. I, I, I'm not sure what to expect. It may be that the court was either waiting on a dissent from another justice or potentially um, expecting protests if this goes a certain way and holding um, the ruling until late in the day Friday. So, so is your thinking that because they held it so long, they are going to make a decision that is controversial to what polls are pointing to, which is most people want to see Mifepristone still be available, especially through the mail? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I have no idea. I mean, it could be this is a complicated case. So the fact that they need a lot of time to figure out what to do with this day isn't surprising. And we also know historically that at times when one or, or other of the justices is writing a response to the decision the court is going to render, that that can be time consuming, too. But we've also seen um, in recent days, even in this case with Judge Matthew Kaczmarek, um, that his ruling was released uh, fairly late on the Friday before Easter, which I think some people believed might have been in a bid to reduce protests because Judge Kaczmarek had been on the record about um, being concerned about that and about um, what that would mean for his safety and others' safety. So I, I'm not, we can't rule that out here. I'm not sure, of course, that that's what's going on because we're dealing with the shadow docket, right? So a lot of this is a guessing game. You, you mentioned, though, an interesting possibility here, Mary, that I don't think a lot of folks have considered, and that's the court doing nothing, just allowing this to expire. What are the odds of that? We've seen the court do that before. Um, when uh, we were dealing last year with SB8, which is the law that allowed um, sort of anyone to sue doctors and other folks who aid people seeking abortion, uh, that expired without the court initially weighing in. Um, and that produced all kinds of controversy that the court wasn't taking this seriously. And the court then um, resolved the matter um, in a different way down the road. But there is precedent for that kind of thing occurring. Um, so yeah. really, any possibility, I think, is still on the table as we wait. 
Just quickly on that topic of, topic of it expiring with no communication, this is a Biden, the Biden administration. The president of the United States has made this appeal. Would that not be a massive slap in the face? In a way, yes. I mean, I think, um, but, and I mean, I'm not expecting that to happen for what it's worth. I'm expecting we're going to hear something from the Supreme Court. It's even possible, although in my, as far as I know, uh, entirely unprecedented that the court could kick the can down the road again and extend this deadline again um, for another several mm -hmm. days. And if that happens, that would be sort of a self-inflicted wound because the other justices beyond Justice Alito will issue these administrative stays with no timeline, right? Essentially, the administrative stay lasts until the justices feel ready for it to be done. And Justice Alito has a habit of kind of instituting these deadlines, um, which is part of why we're talking about this. So uh, it, it's not clear. Um, but yeah, I think that the, it will make the court look bad if they don't um, rule on this at all. So we'll likely get something uh, here, Mary. And to your point, another another extension would be unprecedented. So with that said here, is it possible the Supreme Court then takes up this case on its own? And, and how long would that mean in terms of waiting for an answer? Yeah, so the, the Justice Department um, has asked in the alternative, in addition to asking for this stay, has also asked for the court to expedite its review of the merits. So in other words, to take this case on the mm -hmm. merits sooner than later. It's worth emphasizing that expedite here doesn't necessarily mean quickly in, in normal people world. <laughs> Expedited could mean mm -hmm. the court putting it on the docket um, before Judge Kaczmarek has a ruling on the merits or the Fifth Circuit has a ruling on the merits, but not necessarily in the next you know month or few weeks. So it's, it's a possibility that the court will do that, that the court will decide that it wants to say something on the merits about this before it's worked its way through the lower courts. Um, it's, of course, possible that that won't happen and that the court will wait the process out in the lower courts. But I think given what's been happening, sooner or later, we're going to get a ruling from the court on the merits about this, too. Um, and what we hear from the court today may be fairly unenlightening. Whether the court lets the Fifth Circuit's order go into effect or not, they are not obligated on the shadow docket to say much about why they're doing what they're doing. So we may or may not know much about what the justices are thinking, uh, depending on the order's details today. Well, Mary, we have left less than seven hours to wait. I know you're anxiously waiting, looking at your Twitter feed earlier today. Mary Ziegler, law professor at UC Davis. Coming up the program, defense chiefs from around the world meeting in Germany as Ukraine pushes for more military support. We have seen in the past so many things were impossible and then they become possible. M777s, Patriot, uh, Patriot system, high marches, tanks most recently, right? So everything that was impossible, why waste time? We'll go to the latest developments with the former U.S. ambassador to NATO. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Why give Russia the opportunity to build up their uh, capabilities? Why not end it soon, right? Yeah. Our thinking, our thinking is we need to change our approach from we will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes to let's finish it as soon as possible because every day results in the death of our people and the death of our soldiers on the battlefield. Why procrastinate? That was Yuri Sack, advisor to Ukraine's defense minister, speaking to Joe and I yesterday. Today, the United States pledged to train Ukrainian forces in the, in the use of Abrams tanks. 31 of the tanks expected to be delivered to the country next month. We're very pleased now to be joined by former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Kay Bailey Hutchison. Kaylee, uh, Kay, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what Yuri really uh, kept making the case to Joe and I is what he's making the case to U.S. officials why he's here in Washington, D.C., is that Ukraine needs F-16s. One, do you think they're going to get them? And two, do you even think they do need them right now in terms of their preparation for a counteroffensive? And marie I think that the Ukrainian people and the soldiers have shown us so much spirit, so much commitment, but they are losing thousands of their people. They're losing their infrastructure. And I think at this point that what they're asking for is reasonable. I think air power, I think longer range missiles uh, is very reasonable. And I think if they could take out the bases in Russia that are launching these missiles or, or drones or the airplanes that are dropping uh, these missiles, 
I think that we would start seeing a more level playing field. And I think that really it's time to go for a win and not just a stalemate. That's certainly what uh, Yuri Sock told us yesterday, Ambassador. But it comes down to a question of strategy and best use of resources, according to some. I talked about that today on Bloomberg Radio with Kelly Greco from the Simpson Center. She's a, a senior fellow and spoke to the actual strategy and what Ukraine needs in her view. Let's listen. Switching to the F-16 is an attempt almost to make the Ukrainian Air Force into the American Air Force. Hmm. But Ukraine faces a very different problem set. They are at a quantitative and qualitative disadvantage against the Russians. And so rather than fighting the U Russians symmetrically with F-16s, it's a far more effective and smarter approach to continue with an asymmetric strategy that's been successful so far. So who's right on this one, Ambassador? Should we simply be doubling down on Patriot air defense systems and, and high Mars instead of playing with fighter jets? Joe, I think all of the above. I think we need to strategize to win, and I think we need to do it as quickly as possible so that the rebuilding process for Ukraine can go forward. I think this means that Ukraine must win. Uh, we must stick with them uh, throughout. And I think that means now is the time to make the decision that we will help them win and win decisively. Mm -hmm. Um, Kay, we also, of course, had uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, in a surprise trip to Kyiv. You obviously know uh, NATO HQ very well. Take a listen to what he had to say when he got there to Ukraine. All NATO allies have agreed uh, that uh, Ukraine will become uh, a, a, a member. Ukraine needs security uh, because no one can tell when and how this war ends. But what we do know is that when the war ends, we need to ensure that history doesn't repeat itself. Ambassador, what do you make of Jens Stoltenberg going to Kyiv and saying, NATO, listen, we are ready for Ukraine. Ukraine, you are going to become a part of the alliance. Is he not potentially poking Putin right now? No, I think that NATO has said already that eventually Ukraine would be an ally in NATO. Uh, there, one thing that President Putin misjudged is that Ukraine was on the verge of getting into NATO and using that as an excuse for his aggression. Uh, Ukraine is a very important partner to NATO. It has been for years since the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union. And that has always been in the cards, that when Ukraine was ready, which they have not been, that they would be able to access into NATO. We do hope that is the case. And what Jens Stoltenberg said is exactly the attitude of our NATO allies. But Ukraine wasn't ready. They knew they weren't ready. And they were a valid and very valuable partner for NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, we do want them to be uh, an ally in the future. And I think the future is at the right time. So now we need to help them fend off this terrible aggression against them. They have fought valiantly. And when this is decided, which we hope is sooner rather than later, then we will start uh, trying to help them rebuild for sure. And we will then begin to look at when the timing would be right for them to be an ally. Mm -hmm. Ambassador, as well you know, this has been going on for over a year, and there's a debate that seems to be heating up in Washington about whether the U.S. should be committing this much money, this many resources to the war effort in Ukraine, knowing that this has become a battle of attrition in many cases, certainly in the Donbass region. How much time do we have to play with here? When does this war need to be won? Well, Joe, I, I think that putting the timetable on it is very difficult because I think the Ukraine has the position that you can't do a, a ceasefire right now because the territory of Ukraine has been invaded and you don't want to put in place where the Russians are now. You need to go back to their borders or where the Ukraines uh, feel they can uh, negotiate from 
uh, the position of strength, which is their sovereign border. And I think that at this point, um, we've got to rely on the Ukrainians to make that decision. And yes, we are going to stick with them. And yes, it is costly, but we haven't put one American troop on the ground there. Zelensky's not asking for American troops. He's asking for arms. And I think it is a trade that I would make every day that we would help an ally that is helping itself, that we will not put our troops on the ground, but we will give them the arms they need to protect their territory, which is also uh, in America's interest as well as the European interest. It's in America's interest because other autocrats need to see that we will stand up, we will not lose interest, we will not flag in our commitments, that we will stick with allies and commitments that we have made. And China needs to see that, North Korea needs to see that, Iran needs to see that. Um, it's a message that is for America's interests as well as the Europeans, that we stick with Ukraine and that Ukraine win and there is a peaceful settlement and we will certainly want to do everything to help them rebuild this from this atrocious uh, aggression of Russia on this sovereign nation. Ambassador, there's another place of interest right now on the minds of those at the Pentagon, and that's Sudan. And even though you had Lloyd Austin, the defense minister, uh, secretary, at the contact group in Germany talk about Ukraine, he also made some comments about Sudan. Take a listen. We deployed some forces uh, to, into uh, uh, theater to ensure that uh, we uh, provide as many options as possible if we are called on to do something, and we haven't been called on to do uh, anything yet. No decision uh, on anything has been made. Our focus is to make sure that we continue to do prudent planning and that we create uh, and maintain as many options for uh, our president as possible. Ambassador, should the United States be evacuating U.S. citizens right now from Sudan? You know, that has to be a decision made by the administration, which has the, the people there with an embassy. Uh, and I know uh, in my heart that they will decide when the people in the embassy say it is time to uh, take our Americans to safety. The situation there is certainly volatile. Uh, it's dangerous. Our great Foreign Service officers have been in these kinds of situations in danger before, and they, uh, they act very, very boldly and represent uh, our interests in safety for our own personnel, uh, but also making sure that we do everything we can uh, to uh, make the tensions uh, go away or lessen the tensions, and it's, it's volatile right now. I wouldn't put my opinion there because they know more inside information than I certainly would. Ambassador K. Bailey Hutchison, we thank you, as always, for being with us today on Bloomberg. Coming up on Balance of Power, Ron DeSantis goes to Washington. Mr. DeSantis, again, we'll take a look at the pluses and minuses for the potential presidential candidate with our political panel. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Big conservative victories are few and far between. In Florida, we deliver big victories every single day. We reject the culture of losing that has infected the Republican Party in recent years. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. That was, of course, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis aiming to rally GOP support again here in the nation's capital ahead of 2024. And our political panel joins us to discuss. Our closers are here. Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. Welcome both, as always. A culture of losing, Rick Davis? Who are we talking what, about? What, what is he I'm, talking I'm about? Sure. Must be that uh, Donald Trump's leadership after elected, getting elected in 16 and losing in every midterm and ah. presidential election might have something to do with that. But, okay. you know, a lot of the criticism he's getting from fellow Republicans that I'm hearing is 
you know, this is too soft of an attack on Trump, who's just kicking you out of the door. And so when are you going to really engage? And today's not a day that anybody's going to think he's done that. Got it. I want to bring to both of you this Wall Street Journal poll, which says DeSantis's 14-point advantage in December has fallen to a 13-point deficit, and he now trails Mr. Trump 51 percent to 38 percent among likely Republican primary voters. Jeannie, doesn't matter if Trump has been losing for the Republican Party. DeSantis cannot beat him. That's right. You know, he's gotten this post-indictment, if you will, rally. He has also, we've seen DeSantis stumble in the last couple weeks. Everything from the Disney to the six-week abortion ban. Um, and he also has been losing support in the Florida legislature with a number of members of the Florida delegation endorsing Donald Trump. And, of course, we also heard just in the last 24 hours a former member of Congress, a Republican, come out and say... Mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis never spoke to me when we were in the legislature together. Yeah. So, you know, Donald Trump is Said proven to that. be a really good retail politician. DeSantis continues to stumble. He may recover, but he's going to have to start to recover soon because a double-digit lead for Trump is a pretty sizable lead. Just while we're talking polls here, Rick, are you taking national polls seriously right now? Should Ron DeSantis worry about this? He actually, we have to remind ourselves, hasn't announced a candidacy right. yet. Yeah, I, I don't think it's the polls that matter. I think he's had a bad month, right? I mean, like, when you look at why he's polling the way he is, uh, you know, he hasn't really had a very good pre-rollout. And, 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 and yet, nothing is terminal. Every single candidate has a bad period of time in their campaign. At one point in time, John McCain in 2008 was last place at this time, yes. and he wound up winning the nomination. So it, you can't track the polls but you can track the campaigns. And if he doesn't right the ship, if he doesn't actually find his footing mm -hmm. by next month, Republicans are going to really question whether or not his campaign's on track, regardless of whether he's even announced yet or not. So you can't track the polls or you think we shouldn't be tracking them so closely. But what you can track is these lawmakers that are coming out and endorsing the former president. And what a lot of reporting has been, whether it's political, the New York Times, is that it's personal. Trump gets on the phone and says to these people, I need you, I need you to come out, and spends time with them. DeSantis sends an aide. Right, and that's, that's my point working. about it, don't watch the polls, because the polls actually aren't reflecting that. Hmm. But what his campaign is reflecting is that they're not reaching out, they're not actually engaging. His trip to New Hampshire, you know, he didn't really, you know, act like a good retail politician. I mean, those are the things that people on the inside are watching, saying, gee, I mean, if I'm a donor, am I going to commit? Maybe i got to wait and see what happens here. Uh, but look, I mean... You know, there are a lot of campaigns that have to change their approach, right? And so maybe their approach was, we don't really care if we get all these endorsements. Endorsements really don't matter at the end of the day until, the, until your matter. own state endorses <laughs> against you. And then you think, holy smokes, but i got to get the endorsements. Endorsements again. come from relationships. Yes. relationships. But endorsements, I mean, like, it, it's a nice thing for Trump to have done this because it makes DeSantis look weak. But it actually doesn't make Trump stronger. Right. And so if I had to bet who's going to win the state of Florida, if they're both candidates by the time the primary comes, mm. DeSantis is going to win. So, wow. like, you know, it's it, even though it's not reflected in the national numbers, look at what the people in the state of Florida are doing. Well, so he's been trying to show uh, at least a more, more human side, a more affable approach. <laughs> he went to South Carolina. Yes, we went to South Carolina with his wife. And they had kind of a routine that they cooked up together, talking about their wedding. Maybe relate with people. Everyone can kind of understand that. L listen to how this went. One day, she comes to me <laughs> and says, you know, I was talking to my parents, and, and they were interested in potentially doing the wedding at Walt Disney World. I, I remember when this broke in the news, everybody thought it was so scandalous, like DeSantis got married at Disney. Like, yeah, it was great back then. Uh, Genie? <laughs> Disney World? Bail me out. It, it, it is so hard to, for there's so many odd things about that tape, I'm, I'm not sure where to start. But, you know, one thing we did learn about Ron DeSantis, he has long not liked Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck, didn't want either of them at his wedding. And, <laughs> you know, right. and, you know, looking at what people were saying online when this tape came out, you know, amongst the things was, boy, this looked pretty scripted. And as we get back to thinking about Ron DeSantis's challenges as a retail politician, 
that is certainly going to be a challenge. But we know that about Ron DeSantis. He is tested in Florida. He has not been tested nationally. He needs time to grow. Barack Obama did. But the problem is it's getting late early now for Ron DeSantis. He's got to announce at some point. He's got to start raising the money he needs. And he's got to prove to donors, and big and small, that he can actually take on Donald Trump. You look at these polls. Rick is right. Don't look at national polls. Look at state polls. But you look at the polls. Even in his own party, people aren't sure he can take on Donald Trump. That's a problem for him if he doesn't right this ship pretty soon. So much for the war with Disney. Huh? Right. And at the moment, that problem's not going away. All right, Rick and Jeannie, they're staying with us. Coming up, we're going to be discussing the debt limit showdown. As that ramps up in Washington, will we actually see a vote on the House floor next week? That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Debt ceiling anxiety on the rise in Washington, D.C. Speaker Kevin McCarthy attempts to rally GOP for a vote as soon as next week. But does he actually have 218? Our political panel is back with us to discuss. Rick, I want to start with you. We're, uh, we're reporting that he's coming up short. What do yeah. you think? Well, look, there, nobody in the caucus is talking about not voting for it. So that's a really clear indication that the whips are doing their job, right? That they're convincing people that they want to walk the plank on this. It, it, it's really like a free vote because the reality is everybody in the caucus knows this is not the bill that's going to raise the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so if you have things you want to put in or things that have gotten in, you're in good shape. If there are things you want out of it, you've got another bite at the apple when the bill really gets negotiated with the White House. This is the beginning of the negotiation with the White House. And so I think the caucus attitude is let, let, let McCarthy get what he wants, and then we'll see where it goes from there. So I would bet 218 on Tuesday. 218 on Tuesday, Jeannie. If that happens, does Joe Biden make a date with Kevin McCarthy? I think they will talk. Listen, we're even hearing from Democrats that they are pushing the Biden administration to start these conversations because they, too, look at the calendar. They look at this potentially only 20 days left until the big D-Day, and they wonder if there is time here. So they do want the president to be talking. I agree with Rick. I do think that he does get to 218 next week, but it's going to be a tight squeeze. He cannot afford to lose anyone, and Democrats are just itching to use what Whatever is in this vote in their campaign ads next year. That's hard for some moderates up where I am in New York. It's hard for some conservatives who don't want to vote to raise this debt ceiling. So while this thing will never see the light of day, they're still going to go have to go on the record for a bill that has no chance of passing and potentially hurt themselves in 2024. That's a big ask. And Tom Emmer has his job cut out for him trying to whip this vote. Yeah, it is a big ask, but to Rick's point, it's a means to an end, not the end. And I think a lot of members potentially by Tuesday, Wednesday are going to start to feel that way. Jeannie, quickly, though, while they're going to be voting on a, a clawing back fiscal money that the Biden administration wants to use, Joe Biden's going to potentially be making an announcement for 2024. He is. We're looking for a fourth year anniversary from the last announcement, maybe Tuesday, maybe via video, to tell us what most of us already knew. He told us on the egg hunt, you know, his wife told us in Africa, <laughs> he is going to run, so not a big surprise. But we still don't know if it will be Tuesday. The polls look like he's got his work cut out for him on both the Democratic side and certainly amongst independents, but nobody else is in the offing at this point. Why announce now, Rick? You've made the point mm -hmm. that as soon as you do that, you're changing the rules. He could, he could wait till fall for this. Yeah, I, I really don't see the urgency. Uh, I know they've looked at the calendar, and he's going to be really busy in May and June. And <laughs> next thing you know, Congress is out. There's nobody in Washington. You know, nobody's sure. going to care about politics. Um, I, I, I think he has the option because he's consolidated the leadership of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. No real threat, as Jeannie says. Uh, to wait till the fall. You know, their, their committees are raising the money. They're, they're organizing at the state level. They don't need him to authorize to do any of that stuff. So uh, I think dragging him into politics right now is, is, is the wrong place to be. Let him be president. Let him get things done as president before he becomes candidate Biden.
from a man who has run a couple but presidential But clearly they're feeling campaigns. the pressure of the administration. Absolutely. Maybe they're tired of being asked. Yeah. Even the weatherman <laughs> wants to know. Many thanks. Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital. Jeannie Shanzano, political <laughs> science professor at Iona University. Our closers in a great conversation with us on Balance of Power. And it's Friday. Thanks for joining us. We're still waiting for that Supreme Court decision. Potentially, Joe, we're going to know by midnight. Keep your eyes on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. We'll see you Monday.